three of the seeds is it asked me to do create and maintain healthy soil. And so that's what we're doing tonight. And it's going to be based on no dig gardening. And my experience is um, pretty in depth in agriculture. Been over 50 years of experience in agriculture, certified in soil health and soil life with Dr. Elaine mm -hmm. and Nicole Masters. And currently teach at the Hinsdale School. We operate a farm to school program and I teach agriculture. Started a coaching business. But tonight we're going to talk about no dig gardening basics. So first thing we're going to have to do to wrap our heads around any major change, especially one that is kind of new and something that hasn't um, people have been comfortable with gardening the way they've been gardening since the 40s or 50s. But so to do any major change like this, we first got to think, right? We're going to have to get our minds on board. But let's think about Franklin D. Roosevelt's quote, a nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. Mm -hmm. And I think um, we actually have been doing a pretty good job of that, unfortunately, of um, Really, we've just taken soil for granted for so long that it's it's just ridiculous. So I really appreciate the soil health movement and um, the f guys that have kind of developed what's practices that we're using principles. But we want to create some success. So we're going to do that with knowledge first, gain some consciousness. So if we're not conscious about growing healthy food, then we aren't going to grow it. So we have to have that consciousness and then develop a plan, create the goals, take some action, and then we'll have success. So we're going to be using the regenerative practices and they're just a set of principles. And uh, these are the benefits of them. We'll be improving our soil, going to work with nature. We've been in this huge fight with nature for 60, 70, maybe 120 years, long time. It's about time that we decide, yes, we're going to work with nature because it's the only way that we are going to be successful. Okay, it allows the plant to, con to contain higher nutrient density. Right? We've been really robbing the plant of that for a long time. So we're going to figure out that we are going to work with nature and we will get a higher nutrient density out of our foods. Reduce pests and weeds, and we'll explain a little bit how those things can happen, and reduce water inputs. So the regenerative um, goals is to let the plant and the soil do the work. And that means the soil food web. And together, they're going to create higher nutrient density in our food. R reduce the pests and weeds and no reduce water inputs, all of which are going to reduce your labor, improve soils. And we want those gardens to regenerate from one generation to the next generation, to the next century, to the next century, and so on. And we can do that with these practices and using a no-dig method. So it seems like lofty goals, right? But we can meet these goals. We do have to follow these practices or principles. And the first one is to stop or reduce the disturbance. That's a hard one. We'll talk about each one of these as we go through. So we're just gonna recap the, what they are first. Keep the ground covered, which means cover crop, mulch, or living mulch. So we shouldn't see our soil unless we were going looking for it. That means we would be digging a hole or something. We shouldn't see our soil. So if we go out in a garden, like if I go on a, a consulting visit and I see nothing but brown soil, then they got a huge problem. That's where we have to fix that. And then we wanna have a live plant, which means a live root and the plant doing photosynthesis as much as possible. A little bit tough in Montana, but we can get creative and figure out ways to do that. And we'll talk about why in a minute. Um, grow diversity. That means that we're going to grow plant diversity. And when we do that, we're going to grow microbe diversity because they're tied together. And then we want to add some diversity. 
In my situation, I don't have any animals, so the diversity that I'm adding to my garden is through worms and insects and birds. That's the majority of the wildlife that is in my growing environment. If you can add chickens and ducks, then all the better. Even people that have goats and can use the goats to clean the garden in the fall, those are all great practices. But so we'll be talking about the top four because uh, the majority of people probably aren't going to be using animals until they get more seasoned at, at these practices and what we're doing. So we just talked about these. These are why we do no dig. And I can't stress it enough how important these are. So why wouldn't everybody do no dig? So the people that are really in no dig and been doing it for a long time, they cannot figure out the psychology of the other gardeners as to why they're not doing it. That it's so good <laughs> that we need to be doing it. And we'll talk about some of these more here in a second. So how's all of that possible? Well, the soil microbes are really the key to our success here. And soil microbes, we got to think of the soil is it's alive. It's teeming with life if it's got any health to it at all, and we can stop the disturbance. And it's going to be full of all kinds of different soil microbes that are working for our plant. And then together building a relationship so that plant can be the healthiest that it can possibly be. We're not living up to the genetic potential of any plant that we've created and are growing currently in all of agriculture. And so there's, there's a lot of room for improvement here. So we want that soil to be alive. And these practices are gonna work anywhere. It doesn't matter if I'm in Africa, or if I'm in Brazil, or Europe, or America. It doesn't matter if I'm in eastern Montana, where I'm at, in clay soils, or if I'm in uh, whitefish. It doesn't matter. They're all, they're going to work. And they also will work in a planter, a flower bed, small or large garden spots, and farms of any size. And I mean any size, from your market gardener from an acre or two of land to tens of thousands of acres that the, the practices will work. So what's it going to look like in a garden situation? This is a Laura Reinhardt. She's a client of mine and lives close by. That um, This is her third year of her no-dig garden. And so that gives you an idea of um, what they can look like. Uh, what they will look like is different for each and every person, right? Laura does a lot of uh, crop rotation, is what I have her doing, so she won't have corn in the same spot. So when I go take pictures of her garden this year, the corn will not be in that same spot. It's going to be in a different spot. This is another one. This is in uh, Occidental Art and Ecology Center in Occidental, California. And this is, at this picture time period, this is 45 years of no dig. And so when I did the work with Laura, she's a perfectionist, she could only envision that no dig garden was gonna be messy and wouldn't fit her idea of what a garden would look like. And so I showed her this picture and I asked her, I says, is this too messy for you? And she's like, no, I could do that. So um, it's, it is amazing when you get into it. This is another one. This is a Prairie Road organic seed producers and farm in um, Eastern Dakotas. And th this is 42 years of no dig. And my son and I, Arlie, visited this garden and they let us dig in the soil. And I tell you what, I've never, and I've lived in, four different states, farmed in all of them, been agriculture my whole life, and I've never ever in my life seen soil as good as this soil. And it's the same soil as what we have here in Eastern Montana, it's clay. But with these practices, you can make clay act like loam, act like loam. 
that you could never guess that it was clay. There's something that all of them are doing, right? So this one is covered with a mulch. Laura's was covered with the living mulch. The California one was mm. covered with the living mulch. This is no dig in a lot bigger scale. Gabe Brown's farm in Bismarck, North Dakota. And he did several acres of uh, vegetables and did it in his farm drill. And he um, didn't have a walkways or nothing. It was just all garden plants. It's it crazy. <laughs> but very, very productive. And no, no reason why not every gardener could do a little tiny garden this way with their drill mm -hmm. if they wanted that if there's a will, there's a way. So here's the practices again. I keep throwing the matches so because they're important. <laughs> I want you to realize that if we can't do step one, we are not going to be the benefits of all those benefits I described. So it is important that we do the top four of these practices. And when we do the top four, we're going to have huge successes in our soils. Now, you might not see it your first year, but I can guarantee at the end of your second year, if you've done these top four and you've continued to keep that mulch on top of the soil, you will be seeing a difference at the end of the second year. But the number one step is our mind, that we have to have our mind on board. And so we've got to be thinking positive that we can make this happen. If we are negative and we think there's no one that will, I'm going to be able to control weeds without the tiller, then you're not going to be successful. In fact, your tiller is what's been creating the weeds for you. And so when you run a tiller through a garden, you're just asking Mother Nature to come plant weeds. And by gosh, she does. And she does it very well. And will continue to do that if you don't stop the disturbance. So the disturbances include a tilling event, any chemical event, which would be a herbicide or even urine, urine insecticide. When my mother used to have a, a market garden and she put the powder stuff on all the broccoli and cabbage and stuff, that's a disturbance of the chemical. And so we don't wanna be using any of that stuff. I don't even like using the organic ones, right? I try to do it with the soil microbes in work nature. Synthetic nitrogen fertilizer is very disturbant, is a very big disturbance. The soil microbes are doing that job, and when you go put nitrogen fertilizer on, it's really, that's a whole nother webinar, but that really messes up a lot of stuff, and we just don't want to be doing that. A drought or a flood is also a disturbance. So after we can stop the disturbance, or if we can start on virgin ground that hasn't been disturbed, all the better. My, my yard has become a food forest and it's not been disturbed since the house was built. Uh, the soils are, are just denied because mm -hmm. they didn't have to go through all of that disturbance and reheal all of that. But in step three, we must do this part. And this part is hugely challenging for big ag guys. But for you gardeners, there's almost no excuse that we can do this. It has to be, I set the goal, I'm going to do this part, and you do do this part. And so you should not see your soil. When I look down on a garden, I either see plants, and they're doing photosynthesis with all kinds of leaves up there, like um, solar panels, and they're doing, feeding their, their uh, microbes with root activates because of the photosynthesis or mulch. So I, I don't, I wouldn't know if you had red soil or black soil when I go to a garden. That's what it should look like. I shouldn't be able to know. I don't know what color your soil is, right? Because I'm either going to see mulch, a living plant, or a living mulch in place. So um, if you do want to see your soil, then we're going to take a trowel or a shovel and dig a hole. That's when we would see what your soil really looks like. So you got to think this ground cover is the roof to the soil microbes house. And I want to remind you, like in a tablespoon of soil, healthy soil, there's more microbes 
in that tablespoon than there is humans on humans on the planet. Hmm. They say in a cup, a cup of healthy soil, there's more microbes than there has ever been anything else living on the planet. That is the power in the numbers of the microbes in a healthy soil. So you got to think, I got to take care of them guys, because when you do, they're going to help your plant do all these things that we're, we're saying in our benefits. So think of that mulch as the roof to the soil microbes house. You like living with a roof on your house, right? I do, right? The soil microbes don't like it when they don't have a roof on their house. In fact, they're not even existing in the first top one inch or two inches because that sun is baking that soil, making it dry and hot. They're microbes. They are uh, water loving creatures. They're aquatic. And so they're not gonna live in that top layer if you have black soil or brown soil. Cover it up, get a mulch on there. There's a whole more in depth workshop on this, but we're, you just need to know the basics. We got to keep it covered up. On your screen on your left is the Prairie Road Organic Seed Producers, and they use their own organic hay. So they grow their own hay for this mulching. They mulch their beds every fall with new mulch. The one on the right is, uh, I think it's a wood chip garden cover, one from the the gardening channel so he's a great resource if you want to watch some youtubes on on uh, doing no dig he does it with wood chips i've started out mine with wood chips out of necessity but now i'm converting it to a living mulch uh, plant diversity um, i cannot stress how important the diversity is because the more diverse it is above the ground the more diverse it is below the ground and the more diverse it is below the ground, the healthier it can become because the soil has been healthy and the soil microbes are happy and working for that plant. So I think more diversity, the better. And when those plants start dying down, don't go removing them out of the garden. If you have to make it look pretty, this is all a human eye thing, not a microbe thing. Microbes don't need it to look pretty. Mm -hmm. Cut it down and leave it on the on the ground as a mulch if you absolutely have to clean the garden. Um, I discovered why I shouldn't clean the garden clear back in 1995. I was growing tomatoes, was raising my child, busy as could be running two or three different businesses at the time. And I decided I couldn't garden like I have always garden. So I got square bales of straw at that time there was no chemicals to be concerned with what chemicals might be in the straw place the straw slab after slab after slab right alongside the tomatoes and and covered up everything that i normally would have tilled and called it good my husband thought i was crazy but that fall when i pulled those tomatoes i started pulling and the roots kept going and kept going and kept going six to seven foot rips underneath those two, underneath that straw. And did I have blossom in rot? No, not a single tomato because the tomatoes were healthy enough and had enough root system to go find the calcium they needed it when they needed it. And I don't have any of those problems. So that's just some ideas about this mulch and that wheat straw that I use brought in a lot more diversity to that garden too than the previous. Okay, the leaf, keep a living plant growing as much as possible. You gotta think that living plant, as it's doing photosynthesis, is pumping all of the food to the soil microbes that they want. Um, it won't be all the food because they eat each other, <laughs> but it is the base of how that soil food web is developed is through photosynthesis. And so as a plant's doing photosynthesis, it's creating way more energy than it needs. And it's pumping a lot of it 
some plants 30%. They say some plants can go up to over 70% of all the energy they're creating from photosynthesis that they leak out their roots to the soil food web. When they first discovered it, they like, why are these plants being so stupid and leak leaking all of this hard earned energy into the soil? Well, that's where your masses of soil microbes are gonna be. And I challenge you, when you dig up a live plant in the spring, is that where you find your worms? I can guarantee you that is where you're gonna find worms. They are eating that same uh, structure of what's coming from those red exudates from that plant doing photosynthesis. The more we can keep living, the better we can possibly do. Like for example, if I put in early cabbage and it's gonna come out at one time, then I'm gonna cut that cabbage off at the soil surface, leave the root so the soil food web can eat that root and make a channel for water and for worms and nutrients. And then I'm gonna plant spinach or a late crop of kale or something else once that plant comes out. So you gotta be thinking, okay, I'm taking something out through mid season and put something back in. Come fall, we re-mulch re it with either compost or mulch, depending on if it's your walkway or if it's your bed. Okay, so the plant diversity, you can also think of it as it's composting in place. So as we rotate around the garden, say I have tomatoes in one year, they're a heavy user of nitrogen, they use a lot of nutrients. The next year I may come in with, uh, with kale. For example, kale, that whole cabbage family actually can undo a lot of disease problems that build up from growing tomatoes. So when I go to a garden and, and the people say, that's my tomato row or my tomato patch, that they grow tomatoes there for every year after year. No, we got that thinking and we gotta start thinking Okay, I'm tomatoes one year, it's gonna be a cabbage family the next year. The next year is gonna be a legume. Legume's gonna fix the nitrogen. Then the next year, if you have to, you could come back in with a tomato, but I'd prefer that you went back in with a tomatillo or a cucumber, something else that's gonna be a heavy feeder or a pumpkin. And rotate around and you're gonna break up um, disease problems. So we gotta to try to think to get enough diversity out there that we want to have at least 30 different kinds of plants out there growing. So Dr. Christine Jones recommends that we are consuming at least 30 different food from 30 different plants every week. And I try to shorten that up into a two or three day period of time. And as you do, your body's going to get the nutrients that it really needs to be healthy, especially when we can start producing it in soils like this garden right here. Okay, the last step is the livestock to add diversity. Um, like I said, I add worms to my garden. I've only added them um, in the beginning. I haven't had to add them since. So people that say, well, red wigglers aren't going to live in Montana. I say, come dig in my soil and look under my mulch and look in my compost uh, holding area and there's red wigglers everywhere all different sizes. So it isn't like, oh, they all die off and they come back from eggs. No, they are living. I gave them a place to live. And so they are there. Okay, so uh, red wigglers I have. I have gray earthworms and I have some night crawlers that I have from uh, my neighbor sells night crawlers. So I get his bedding once in a while and put it in my Worm, well, my worm composting area. And so I have a few of them. And I really like those night crawlers where I've got my apple trees and fruit trees because so, they're going to be able to pull a, a uh, leaf down and they will take those diseased leaves down into the soil three foot deep. And guess what? I don't have any diseases then. So there's places that you can add just simply adding a few worms and let them um, reproduce and we've stopped disturbing the soil so we're going to have more and more of them. I do have a large large diversity of uh, insects in my um, garden though. Uh, adding chickens would be great as long as you're able to control them. 
ducks are even better if you have any slug issues at all. Ducks are fantastic at it. There's um, duck herders in Europe that they go in and they clean orchards with ducks. But uh, there's people that have ducks that clean up, clean their gardens too. Okay, you get to decide how all this is going to look. So you can just kind of figure out what is my goal? What am I trying to get it to look like? I go with what is your resources in your area? In my area, we grow wheat and alfalfa. So I'm using old alfalfa hay as my mulch. And I have a large availability of wood chips because all of these towns on the Milk River system have a lot of trees in them and they chip them for the power poles and then they wanna get rid of them. So I, I get them dumped and then I use those. Um, so whatever you have is what you'll wanna use. So for example, in a large a garden, um, in the beds, I'd probably go with, uh, for sure, no matter where you get your mulch, you want to make sure that it's weed free. I prefer that a second and third cut in alfalfa because as producers harvest alfalfa, in the second cutting, there's no grass or other weeds left. Then by the third cutting, it's pure alfalfa. They want to produce that alfalfa at its highest maximum nitrogen um, availability which will be the highest nutrients for your garden too. So they, they won't have seed on it. So you won't have seed on a third cut in alfalfa. Um, you can use straw. So have to be really concerned about who you're getting it from. You really need to know your farmers and maybe go in their, their shed to make sure what kind of chemicals that you just gotta be super careful. Uh, a lot of uh, organic straw could be full of weeds and cause you even bigger problems. So you just really need to know your farmer and what's going on with his straw. That's why I recommend alfalfa to whoever if we can get on this part of it. Okay, we're going to use that in the waffles. If you chose to use a living mulch, like Laura Reinhardt's garden, then we use a white Dutch clover to be able to do that. She seeded hers in the fall and then reseeded in. Um, spots that was needed in the spring. Uh, bird's foot trefoil would work in western Montana too. I, I would like to use a mixture of them. Blue grama grass is a short grass that's a bunch of grass. It would work too. So there's just other ways that you, depends on your what's available to you and what you want it to look like. So we're going to start by laying out those beds. Um, I like to straddle a bed at times, and there's other times that I like to work a bed from the side. So you just have to decide the beginning in your planning stages. In this particular one, this is Laura Reinhardt in the beginning aspect of her garden. She wanted to mow her walkways, that clover, so she had them set up on a 24 inch because that's how wide her mower was. So whatever it is, yours is gonna look different than hers because everybody's is gonna look different. This is a little closer up of what that looks like. And where you see the mulch is her growing beds. She didn't have it completely mulched. I took this picture before she had the, the, the first year even all fully done. Hers is a big garden, so she had to use mulch, different kinds of mulch to be able to get it done the first year. After that, we was able to start using the, the when she mowed the walkway, the, the throw out from the mower adds mulch to the beds every single time she mows. And then her plants are, are not removed. They, unless they are diseased, the only time you're gonna remove one with, is if they are diseased. So if they're not diseased, then you could just chop them up in place or just let them break down in place. Um, watering is, weight, is really reduced in this situation because of the, the soil is covered. So, but we wet the beds and then we kept the walkways moist to germinate that clover. And then this is what it looked like at the um, mid season of the first year. So she's got a really good catch on it. This is Robin Kelson and she had a visit to us last summer. And this is what it looked like right after it was mowed. And this was in, uh, I believe it was early July, late June, maybe. Yeah, 
And that's the backside from this year. Um, you don't want to see the soil. And so that's very evident that we don't see any soil in that picture, right? That's planting it densely, but not overcrowding anything. This is what it looks like um, in the winter, early spring. In a small garden, it's almost easier. Well, it is easier because we can control our size. We're gonna start with cardboard. A lot of people will go in on a garden patch that's already got quack grass or something because it was an old garden spot or a lawn. And so we're already dealing with problems in the very get go. So we're gonna use cardboard, but we wanna make sure it's from North America. Um, North America will have a round stamp on all cardboard made in the whole North American continent. And then they have rules and regulations as of what is in that cardboard. That's what you want. If you get cardboard without that round stamp or in that round stamp says something from some other continent, don't use that cardboard. Right, use North American cardboard. We're pretty assured that it's real paper products and not gonna hurt your garden. Uh, we talked about the weed-free mulch. Um, other materials you're gonna need is your compost and some sort of uh, wood chips or straw. That is the label, the North American stamp, the particular ones that made in Wisconsin. Okay, so you're just gonna break that cardboard down, remove all the plastic, and I try to use cardboard that doesn't have too many stickers on it. Remove whatever you can on it. Then we place the um, cardboard on the ground, and then we're gonna add uh, compost on top of it, and then mulch on top of that. This is a regenerative planter see the plant diversity and the plant density that we're shooting for. Okay, so we got some questions coming in the chat, I hope. We um, do. Okay, so let's flag some questions and then we can go back to uh, talking about planting some potatoes if we want to. Okay, first question from Samantha. If using straw as a mulch in growing beds, is it important to wait until seeds have germinated? And can you mulch over sown seeds? Right, so we're, we're talking about the weed seeds or what kind of Samantha, seeds? Samantha, feel free to unmute yourself if you wanna answer that. Sure. Um, no, I guess I'm not talking about the weed seeds. So I would definitely be new to no dig gardening. If I was transitioning um, mm -hmm. a previously tilled garden to a no-till, right? Would you, you know, if you're considering adding straw mulch and you've already like sown your seeds for that season, could you could you mulch on top of those sown no. seeds? Yeah, you have to no, wait. It's gonna kill it. So. Okay. Um, what I prefer is people start thinking about, um, we either start doing the planning in the summer for the next season, or we start the planning of what am I going to attempt to do before spring hits, before you plant anything. But you can do it after you've planted some stuff because you're going to mulch the walkways, right? So you'd your goal would be mulch the walkways ASAP as fast as you could. And then you're growing beds, hopefully they're beds and not just broadcasted everything growing, right? Because you're gonna need some walkways to service your, your beds. Right. So, yep, Thanks. mulch on top. Great. Um, I don't see a, a next question here, but for those who are beginners, um, can you just briefly say what the difference is between traditional gardening or historical dig gardening and no dig? What's the main difference between the two in terms of a process? The process in a in a traditional garden setting, they would have cleaned all the plant material out of the garden in the fall and tilled the whole garden 
So the whole garden is black, what we call black or brown. So it's nothing but tilled soil exposed to the sun for the whole winter. And then weeds germinate because that's Mother Nature's alarm system. Her goal is to keep the ground covered at all costs, at all times. And she will do that. And she's going to do that after you've done a tilling event because that's a major, major event to the soil food web. It would be like um, Whitefish, Montana, getting a, a tornado and it tore out half the town or more. That's a lot. That's a big event, right? So that tiller is doing that much destruction. And so then they leave it with the soil exposed. So those microbes are dying in the first two inches of all of their soil throughout the whole winter. And then come winter, come spring, they till it again as soon as they can get into the soil. They'll, as soon as it's dry enough, they'll till it again to prep the bed. And then what's happened? Mother Nature is like, oh my gosh, now we've had a fire to the other half of whitefish because of that tilling event. Those microbes are not going to work for your plant and give your plant high nutrient density because they're trying to rebuild their house. They're trying to just survive. They're not working for that plant when those tilling events take place. But so then they till, then they plant, and then they wait for their seeds to germinate. And then when they germinate, so does the weeds with their seed. Then they gotta go in there and hoe and uh, remove weeds. And then they're usually in a fight with pests and diseases especially if they haven't moved these tomatoes around and different things because they just are, they created it. So then in, a, in this no dig situation, we didn't create any of those problems for us. So we've got mother nature, um, soil microbes working with the plant, delivering it all of the periodic table that it needs, right? So when I was in college, they only talked about NPK then they start talking a little bit about the sulfur. Then they start talking a little bit about um, the, a couple other micronutrients. Now they talk about the whole gamut that nature knows what they need and we just need to stay out of its way. But when we go in there and fertilize, so in your traditional tilling garden, they go in there and fertilize and then that's disturbing the, the, the situation even more. The no dig, you're just gonna mulch and plant where you want plants. Great. Okay. Now we've got some, we've got some uh, new questions rolling in. Um, great. Yay, okay. From <laughs> from <We> Courtney. <laughs> <laughs> Courtney asks. Oh, they're rolling in faster. I'm gonna scroll back <laughs> up here. Um, I have a larger area, and I'm wanting to go no dig, but there is okay. crabgrass growing in this area. Is it better to use the cord cardboard method? on a larger scale or use a living mulch to try to compete with the grass and weeds? With crabgrass, you gotta know your enemy. So if it's crabgrass, then we need to be using the cardboard. And uh, somebody that's a really good resource to watch how they do it, and he explains all of it. They call it cooch grass over there in Europe. We call it crabgrass. But Char Charles Downing's No Dig video, will address that completely. So they, they just go right in with whether the garden was tilled or if it's a yard, it doesn't matter. Go in and cover it with cardboard and then they put six inches of compost on top of it in their growing bed. In their walkway, we would put four to six inches of wood chips or straw or hay or whatever we're using for the walkway that first year. So that first year, that walkway is gonna have to be a uh, mulch that we brought in. It can't be a living plant that first year. In fact, I wouldn't put a living walkway in for a couple years until I knew I had that crabgrass under control. So as that crabgrass is going to try to come up through that cardboard, and it will, your soil microbes are breaking down that cardboard as fast as could be. In fact, they'd love it. The, the worms just are crazy about it because it's all plant um, paper materials with um, animal glues in it that they that's just high protein and they it's yummy yummy for them so they're breaking it down relatively quickly but that crabgrass is going to have to work its way up through that and then get through your six inches of mulch or compost 
And so it's stressed by the time it makes it to the top of the soil surface to start doing photosynthesis. And then you're going to pull it and pull out all, all the root that you can. And you'll just have to continue doing that. If I could find a spot that didn't have crabgrass, that's probably what I would do um, first. But if you have it and you have no other choice, then it's the cardboard method. Great, thank you, Patty, and thank you, Courtney. Um, from is it Dulce or Dulce? Either way, <laughs> you can correct me. In soils where there are lots of rocks, do you leave them in place, or is it better to clear some? Depends on how big they are. If they're big enough to trip on, then I would remove them. If they're not, they're they're just actually help heat the soil and are not that big a deal, as long as they're not something that you're gonna be tripping over or they're just huge and your roots can't go around them, then they'd have to be removed. But if it's smaller rocks, then no, I wouldn't remove them. And if you have a lot of small rocks, more than likely somebody has reduced the topsoil in the area from their tilling events. So, or you're, you're working on a shale ridge or something, you know. But yeah, I would leave them. Great, thank you. From Pam, if I am using clover for walkways, doesn't the clover try to spread into the produce area? It will somewhat, but you're you're you should have two to three inches of mulch wherever your plant is not got its root or its stem sticking up. Right, that pretty well discourages that clover. It'll discourage it enough that it's not gonna set a very hard root into that mulch. You could go through there with an edger or just pull it back and turn it back into your walkway. That's probably the one of the only maintenance part other than mowing the clover is when that clover in its second year will start wanting to creep, but it's not gonna creep aggressively as long as you keep mulch there. If you don't keep mulch there, you're gonna be growing clover. Right, but we want mulch there, and you're going to want your plants looking like this planter that it's taken all the photosynthesis okay. clover. The clover is going to think, I don't want that kind of competition. I'll stay out here in the walkway. And the white dutch is real short <clears throat> on a really wet year when it's able to do a lot of photosynthesis, it might be six inches tall, but most of the time it's going to be shorter than that. I want it to about three inches and then it's just enough to to set it back when you do mow it you release some nitrogen from the plant itself into the soil and then that mulch thatch that you throw she throws it one way one mowing and back the other way the next mowing so that you're adding in nitrogen mulch to that bed every single time you mow it i mean it's just unbelievable right Okay, question from Kitty. How do you feel about cottonwood slash choke cherry leaves as mulch? In a new smaller bed, should they go above or below my cardboard or not include them at all? No, they're great. Yeah, and the more diversity of those um, deciduous trees, the better. Good job for getting to use them, right? Because the people in the mountains have a uh, challenge with a little bit more of the pine, but the deciduous trees, the more leaves, the better, and they're gonna go on top, right? So you think your wood chips are leaves, if I mix it into the soil <clears throat> or it's touching the soil, or you know where people really go wrong is when they, they mix it. They mix wood chips with the soil. That will tie up nitrogen, but if your, your um, leaves are on top, especially on top of the cardboard, they're not going to do any harm whatsoever, but there's going to be fantastic. Great, thank you. Uh, from Caroline, I am interested in a live cover crop. Are there mm -hmm. any other crops you recommend besides the white Dutch clover? In what environment is she growing in? Is she Caroline, in white? Can you <clears throat> feel free to speak up, Caroline? I think Patty's question was, um, what environment are you growing in? Where are you located? So we're in the mountains. 
okay. in the mountain. Can so you you're, um, birch root yeah, tree. Yeah, we live in birch root tree foil is a legume and it's fixed in nitrogen. It would work really good in your area. Um, the blue grandma, which is a native bunch grass, it's a very short bunch grass that'll only get about six inches tall. It would also be good. I wouldn't let it go to seed, but you'd be using a mower to control this walkway no matter what you do. Um, Elaine Ingham's got a longer list of plants, but I think they're more targeted toward the California climate than our climate. But in our climate, those three would be as much diversity as I can think of that I've seen be successful. It, Do not put in a grass that creeps, right? Um, Kentucky bluegrass, any of them. It has to be a bunch grass. So blue grandma. Thank you. Okay. Great, thank you, Carolyn. Uh, from Karen, so you don't fertilize at all? So I'm sure that's a common question, but what is, what is um, your thought on that? So you will do some amending um, with, say, uh, fish emulsion, kelp, seaweed, worm castings. You can add um, rock dust and Bone, bone meal, blood meal, depending on if you're organic status and what they will and won't let you use. But those sort of things is what you would be amending the, your soil with. So like this planter, for example, it's got wood in the bottom of it. So it's kind of like a hugel culture. And then we put the expensive soil because we, we imported soil from the flathead for this planters from the peat bogs there and put that on top of the wood and then in the very top of it in its second year we had to amend it with some organic type fertilizer alfalfa pellets work well for the amendment um, so that you re do reboost that nitrogen in your top six inches or so and then plant it in that and so I kind of read the plants, like you look at these plants here and they are the optimum. They're doing everything they can possibly do in my eyes. And they are not showing any signs of um, lacking any of the, the key nutrients. And so, and they break down in place. We'll cut them up because some of the older towns people like to see a prettier situation. So we may cut them up, but we're gonna leave that right there in place and make their own. Great. Hope Thank I you. I might have got sidetracked there. <laughs> hey, it's okay. It's all learning, right? Um, from Samantha, again, do you recommend planting a cover crop in the fall when a traditional garden would typically be tilled? If so, what species or mix of species do you recommend? So there's several things you could do. Like, for example, if you have compaction and if you've been tilling, you dig a hole, everybody dig a hole, right? You dig a hole to find out what sort of soil am I dealing with and what, how tight is it? Is it compacted? I could bet anybody in the nation, if they've been tilling, they have a hot, very hard compacted layer at the bottom where that tiller run, right? They call that hard pan. And so those roots hit that hard pan and they turn sideways. So if you've been tilling a lot and say you can only till down four or five inches, that's all the depth that your plant root has been living in all this time. And it may be a hundred years since they've been farming it. In the snow till and no dig, my plant roots may be going six foot deep, depending on the plant and using all of those nutrients from that big of root area because I don't have the hard pan that discourages those roots and turns them sideways. So you dig a hole to kind of start figuring out some of this stuff. What was the question again? I'm sure I got sidetracked there. Did, does that answer it? You're talk, we were asking about a mix of cover crop for the yes. fall. Yeah, is, is there a good mix of cover crops or one species like that would potentially break up that hard pan? 
Yeah, so you're, they have uh, daikon radishes. They're the long white radish. There's, um, you can go to a, a farm store that sells cover crop and, and get a tilling radish. And so I would plant them midsummer. So like say when your, your early season stuff come out, put those down, but I like to put them down with, um, with buckwheat and some other flowering type plants. So I always think diversity. So I don't plant just straight radishes unless I need a trap crop for flea beetles. Then I would plant straight radishes. But there's there's um, cover crops that you could use that would help um, with your soils. You can put in uh, your spring grain in the late summer. It's not going to winter through. It's going to die with the first frost. But then that's going to give you a nice mat and it's done quite a bit of photosynthesis leading up to that frost. And so that'd be spring wheat um, or spring barley, oats, those all would work good too. So, but think diversity that you wanna put more than one thing in. Buckwheat's really fast at coming up. It's really fast to flower, gives the bees all that much more nectar. And if you think if you're drawing in um, pollinators, you're drawing in other beneficials, that's gonna help your garden with any pest management. So the more insects you have, the better. So think, how am I gonna feed them? I love the sweet alyssum, which is in the middle of this planter, because it's gonna last all the way until late, late frost and killing frost, because it's a cool season crop, it can handle it. And so it will be given a nectar source for your um, beneficial insects from early spring all the way through the season so you can throw some flowers in there too. Thank you. Um, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, I see a question from Pam about uh, wood chips being free of chemicals if you buy them in bags and where would you get them in the whitefish area and some of our lovely participants have shared that um, for local wood chips we could you could ask the Kalispell Wood Turners Club, Glacier Wood Turners, because um, they usually have a bunch of chips to get rid of. And um, I thought there was another wood chip source, but do you have any thoughts on that locally, yeah, definitely, Patty? Definitely recycle your local wood chips. I wouldn't go out and buy them. And never buy the ones with the dye in it. That would be like um, for us, compared to the soil food web, that somebody poured paint over our whole house on beds everything because of that dye so don't do that <laughs> so recycle um i get mine from the landfill or from other people that have got these power pole guys to dump their wood chips because it's a free source resource or you can come to my place because i'm always having to cull trees <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, some people, well, if you got a lot of trees, you buy your own chipper and do your own. I have my own chipper for that very reason. You know, you got a yep. bunch of trees on the land, you're always having to pull the dead yep. branches. Um, so the final question that we have time for, and then I'm just going to do a little bit of a closing here. From Patty, do you remineralize? Like if I took a soil sample, you mean, and got a test run? And Patty, feel free to unmute yourself. I'm muted. No, no, no. I mean, Patty Mason is the person oh, asking the question. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, unmute yourself so I can understand the question a little better, please. Yes, I'm wondering if you, you know, add any um, mineral t things like uh, sulfur or iron or calcium or magnesium, no. manganese, zinc. No, I would I would never do that without a really extensive soil test and most gardeners don't wanna pay for that. And most of the time when you add those micronutrients or even when you're adding the NPK, you're adding too much and you're creating a disturbance because of it. And now you got an imbalance that needs to be fixed. And so we just need to step out of mother nature's way and let her work with that. So that your soil microbes are delivering those micronutrients to the plant as needed. So when a plant is sending out signals that it needs boron, microbes bring boron to the root zone for that plant in exchange for the root exudates. 
And so just let them do that. The plants are going to heal your soil. That's what makes it so easy, right? To do the no dig. So yes. thank you everybody for all the great questions. Um, if we didn't get to your question, feel free to um, email me and I can pass it along to Patty. Um, also, I wanted to mention a couple of things. The recording of the session will be available on free to seeds, montana.com and Montana is all spread out, uh, spelled out uh, in the build skills section. So usually I say I get it up by the weekend, but usually I try to get it done within the next couple of days. Um, so you will be able to see that there then. And then I also wanted to mention that Patty is a fantastic consultant and everybody's garden situation is slightly different as we can tell from the questions here today so please do feel free to um, reach out to patty and um, if you need some help with your garden and want some consulting services she's really a wealth of knowledge about those types of things the third thing i wanted to just give a plug for we are encouraging people if you've attended previous sessions you know we've said this before we're encouraging people to save their seeds. Um, Free the Seeds has a seed swap every year. We're really ramping up and getting a lot more folks involved in that. So if you are interested in getting started and don't know where to start, just shoot an email to seeds at freetheseedsmontana.com and we will be circling back with folks to help you get started regardless, even if you're at a beginner, we're happy to help you. Um, so and thank Izzy, you, everybody. I'll oh, go ahead and talk. Real quick, Izzy. Um, I'm going to be at Spirit Works in, in Whitefish on the 30th for advanced uh, questions and answers for a uh, session in the morning and a session in the afternoon. It'll be a three hour session. So if you are in the valley and you've got um, concerns or just want to come hang out and learn from everybody else's questions and answers, I think it's going to be pretty exciting and should be very knowledgeable. So that's on the yeah, 30th, so Saturday. Here it works, Herb Farm in Whitefish. Um, if you do a search online, right. you should be able to find it easy, easily. Mm -hmm. um, Lindy Dewey is the owner of that farm, so you can also look yep. it up by her name. And when it comes to saving the seeds, it's super important to know how far apart we've got to plant them to save the seeds. So I always... Uh, text my friend Charlie Overbay to find out how far can I keep a cucumber from another cucumber and he texts back a half a mile right so <laughs> a lot of people don't realize how far we have to be isolated and so you have to really plan ahead of where you're going to plant those plants and then you have great seeds to share with lots of people great well, thank you once again, Patty. You're fantastic. Thank You're you, everybody welcome. who was able to attend today. We'll get this up online as soon as I get to it. Um, and um, I, Patty, will you make this presentation available by a PDF I can put on the site as well? Or Yes. And uh, the recording, yeah. I think I'll, I'll be able to turn it into a video and put it onto YouTube to share it with you that way. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. We'll look forward to seeing you at the next session. The next session will be um, in June. And I, I don't remember the 13th or 17th, but I will send out a registration email. And we're going to go through some tours of early gardens um, to hey. show you guys what the, what the gardens look like sort of mid-June in the, in the valley. Um, and many exciting workshops after that. So look forward to seeing you guys next time. And again, thank you so much. And you guys are doing that online, the tour? We are. Nice, exciting.